All right, hey, how about these new t-shirts, yeah? You like the t-shirts? Yeah. We, we need more of these, right? I mean, it only took us like 29 years to come out with a t-shirt. Good grief. Carissa, is Carissa share? I don't know, if you see Carissa share, I think they designed this, so good stuff. I think we need more of this. Speaking of more, um, we have some, some things to celebrate. Uh, we had more people, more people finding their way back to God this summer than ever before. I want you to go check it out. Take a look at this, these, some of these numbers just real quick. Um, last year at summertime, same 13 weeks, we had about 4,794. This year, 5,293. 499. Somebody should have found us a 500th person, don't you think? Seriously. Um, that's about 10% increase, which is, which is really great stuff. One of the things I'm most excited about, though, overall, our student ministry. We got to give it up for them. Our student ministry has grown by 19% this year compared to last year. So, <laughs> woo! Good stuff. And here's the reason. I mean, we count people because people count. Uh, we're talking about helping people find their way back to God. And so when you see numbers like that, uh, I want to show you this next picture here. This is, this is Melinda. Melinda's one of those 5,000 plus people, just one of them. And this is her getting baptized two weeks ago, and I think it was just right, right over here. Um, let, me, let me just read her story. And think about this now times how many thousand. She said, when I was six years old, my parents divorced, and my siblings were divided between my mother and father. My world changed forever. My mother was an alcoholic who often left my sister home alone. It, these were her own words. It wasn't uncommon for us to go without food because my mother would spend the money on alcohol and I was neglected by my mother and abused by both her second husband and, her, and his son. I was living my life so far from God. For years, I was searching for something that was missing in my life. And what was missing was God's unconditional love, his forgiveness, and a sense of belonging to a family, God's family. I had a lot of questions and no answers. Where were you, God? Why didn't you stop this abuse? Do you even care? I may not ever have all the answers to all my questions, but I have found what I needed. I found a loving God who sent his son to die for me so I could be welcomed into his family, a God who's rescued me from my past and given me a hope and a future, and that is why I'm here today to take that step of obedience, to be baptized in an outward sign of an inner work that Christ has done in me. Is that awesome or what? I was, I, was, I, was, uh, I was at another location, and Ian Simpkins, who's our community pastor, Ian was telling me that she had kind of had her walker, and she, she has a walker, and she was over there, and as she's going over there, I mean, just tears were already streaming down her eyes, and as we started reading her story, she just had her hands in the air like this whole time, just going, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I mean, Ian was saying, I mean, it was like, that was the real deal. And I'll tell you what, that's why we do what we do. Are you with me on that? Turn to someone near you and say, hey, that's why we do what we do. That's why we do what we do, right there, all right? And um, one of the things, we, we have a great opportunity for you to help more of your friends, more of your family members, your neighbors and coworkers find their way back to God. Um, answer me out loud. What is happening on September 17th? <laughs> Nicely done, right on cue. That's, wow, very impressive. I like it. Um, do you got your, got your five? You got your five? I think I got mine here. Actually, actually, I don't have five. I'm a little bit of an overachiever. I have eight, all right? Here's my eight. Um, but these are people that we all said that we're gonna invite and um, on Monday, two days from now, on Monday, September, uh, Monday, uh, September 11th, I'd love for you to join me as uh, we're gonna have a day of prayer and fasting. And historically, every great movement of God is almost, you, you can kind of look back and you can say there's always two components. God's people doing whatever it is that God calls them to do, kind of the work of it, but then also God doing what only he can do. And, that, and, we, and we come to him and ask him to do that through prayer. Uh, I, was, I was talking, some of you may have saw this on our new thing, the Facebook page. I got a chance to interview and uh, do a podcast and talk to a guy named Sam Stevens. Sam's the guy who's the head of the India Gospel League. And uh, he was in India, in, in India, but I was talking to him over our Zoom platform. This guy in the last 25 years has now planted almost, him and, his, him and the people, the leaders he works with, has now planted almost 90,000 churches. I know, it's like you go 90,000 people. No, 90,000 churches. I mean, it's millions and millions of people. I don't, it's unprecedented as far as anybody I know in the whole world. And as we got a chance to talk, one of the things he kept coming back to over and over again was the importance of prayer. Was the importance of prayer. And so, I mean, for us, as we, can move, as we move towards, uh, you know, show up Sunday, let's all of us, you know what? I am committed. I'm committed to inviting these five folks 
I'm going to do what I have to do, but I'm also, on Monday, you know, we'll join together as one in prayer, so asking God to do what only he can do. And, and I'll tell you what, this, this, let's go to the next slide. This show up Sunday, the, um, our, our, we're starting a brand new series, if you haven't heard yet, called Simplify, and I love the sub-theme too, Calming the Chaos in Our Souls. I cannot think of a more relevant, pertinent topic for today. I mean, when you think about what's going on in our world right now, I mean, you got political chaos, where I, I, I have not, I don't remember a time where it felt more polarized. You got international chaos, where you got, I mean, North Korea seeming like they want to bomb everybody. You got environmental chaos. We've had a second, another time, maybe even a third hurricane coming through. Not to mention, okay, the normal personal chaos, right, that your friends, families, neighbors, coworkers all feel on an everyday basis. And, and every one of our locations have worked really hard. We've got a great message that week. There's gonna be terrific music. First impressions are gonna put their best foot forward. Kids City, student communities, all gonna be ready to go. Um, so I'll tell you what, let's all, let's just all commit. We're gonna do this together as one on September 17th, okay? All right. It's gonna be a big day. And um, <clears throat> speaking of one, we are now in the home stretch of our one initiative. We started this about 17 months ago. Uh, we have seven months to go. When we came together, we all made a commitment to one. We said there was two things we were committed to. We said, first of all, that we were committed to say, every one of us, we're gonna make God number one in our lives. God, it, it, either a first time commitment or a recommitment, make God number one in our lives. But we're also, in a brand new way, we're coming together as a whole, just saying we are one in this mission. And what we've discovered over the last 17 months in a brand new way is that we are better together. We are better together than we are when we're trying to do things on our own. And I just wanna celebrate some of the wins over the, over the last kind of year or so of, the, of the, the One Initiative. One of them, and I get big thank you, particularly to you as leaders, because you've sacrificed, and you've also led the charge, asking other people to make sacrifices for, for what we believe are important things that God's leading us into. One thing is what, what, what this brand new space down in, uh, down in Plainfield. Let's go to the next slide. The brand new space down there. Um, that's not happening if we don't come together as one location. And over the last, over the last year, they've seen it, we've seen at our Plainfield location a 38% increase in attendance, and over the last year, 92 people were baptized. <laughs> Is that awesome? And um, the growth has been so great. On Show Up Sunday, we're adding a third service at our Plainfield location. Um, many of you know we also, part of what we did to kind of serve the community, we also built a, a Plainfield Sportsplex. You may not know this, but the very first weekend it was open, we had more than 1,000 visitors, more than 1,000 visitors that were there as a part of the, of the Plainfield Sportsplex, and we're now got things up and rolling. It looks like we're gonna be more than self-sustaining in the, in the first year, so that is also really, really good news, all right? <laughs> So that's down in Plainfield. If you go over to Aurora, in Aurora, we got a brand new home in Aurora on LaSalle Street. Isn't that right, Obi? And if you haven't been, it's a, it's a terrific space. We're actually having the grand opening. It's gonna be, we've been meeting there through the summer, but the grand opening's gonna be on the 17th. Um, some really neat things are already starting to happen. One of the things they do in Aurora, if you're not familiar with the community, they have um, First Fridays. And on First Fridays, they'll stop at a handful of businesses and where you get to kind of uh, explore kind of downtown Aurora. One of the stops on First Fridays is at Community Christian Church, which is great. And um, we've already had people who will show up on one of the First Fridays, and then guess what? They come back on Sunday, which is exactly what we hope for. And uh, so some great things are happening. And again, uh, what we're learning is that we are better together. We are better together as, as one. Um, another example how we're better together as one is our Stuco summer camp. Um, if you were a part of that, again, thank you, so good. Last year, last year's summer camp was awesome. We had 334 students that went to summer camp last year, and that was great. This year, we had 579 junior high and high schoolers. And um, seriously, I am so proud and also so grateful uh, for the leadership, um, both at a staff level and then also at a volunteer level for our, for our student, student community. I, I wanna share, you, share with you one letter that we got after camp, and kinda let us set it, I wanna set it up, um, is Mimi and Teresa. Mimi and Teresa are sisters, but they're, but they're actually 24 years difference between them. Uh, Mimi was adopted, and Teresa, who's the older one, she started attending community about, oh, about two years ago. And, uh, and then her younger sister, along with her parents, who are very Catholic, they 
came to community uh, um, sometime oh, this, this spring. One of the Sundays we were actually having baptisms. And we were encouraging people to get baptized. And so both turned out that both Mimi and Teresa got baptized, which they called that, that was the best day of their lives. Okay, now let's fast forward to summer camp. This was Teresa's email. I think she sent this, it was, I think maybe to Jordan Berry. She sent this, said this, said, the first time the Stuco camp was brought up during the service, I asked, uh, I asked Mimi if she'd be interested in going, and she said yes. Once we received the info, she was so excited. I talked to our mom, and I pulled out the charge card to set it up. I knew this was gonna be important for her. She didn't care that she didn't know anyone, and, and she still wanted to go. Throughout those five days, she would sneak me a text saying how amazing it was, how she never felt closer to God or more able to be herself. You all, I love this line, you all brought her to God and brought her to herself. Um, I forgot to mention, Mimi's, I think, I think the students would say, a little out there, she's got wild blue hair and kind of, she's expressing herself. Because um, this is kind of important. She goes on, words kind of express how very blessed I am to have found a church like community. Thank you for talking about the hard topics. Thank you for preaching in simple terms for people like me. Thank you for the non-judgmental environment who accepts a girl who sometimes dresses like a boy who has multicolored hair and facial piercings. Thank you for bringing us all back to God. And I, I just wanna say, you know, thank you to our student community. Let's give them a little love, all right? Good stuff. Good, good stuff. And a couple other things that we're doing as one. Okay, these things, we come together as one. One of our, our part of our one initiative also is church planning. It happens through, through New Thing, our international network of reproducing churches. Um, we started as one church, and, but it has continued just to expand. And I, wanna, I just want to celebrate this with you too. Over the last couple years, two years ago, 2015, there were 320 churches that were part of, of New Thing, reproducing churches. As of July, we now have 1,368 churches that are commitment to be reproducing. And this is something that's happening, and I would, anybody wants to talk, I'll talk your ear off about this stuff, but it's happening both domestically and globally. If we go globally, three weeks ago, I think it was three weeks ago, where's Patrick, I'm looking for a nod, we're in Uganda. We did a catalyst community, in, what we call catalyst community in Uganda, where we brought together about 25 churches that said, we wanna plant more churches. And we've kind of created this process that we've given to them, and over the course of about three days, they came together and they made commitments to plant 200, 200 and what time frame was that, Patrick? Over the next... For the next three years, 200 more churches there in Uganda. That's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's just one example. Then if you go back two weeks ago, my brother John Ferguson, John brought together, I think we had about 15 churches across Chicagoland. It was an awesome experience. I, and I think this is super encouraging because you had, you had folks from the city and you had folks from the suburbs. You had folks from the, folks from the north side and folks also pastors and leaders from the south side. You had every kind of hue, okay, on the, on the spectrum of color that was in that room. And we all came together and said, hey, how can we together, and we're still working on the goals, but how can we together plant churches across Chicagoland? And I'll tell you what, in, in, a, in the middle of, a, of a, what it feels like a more and more divided kind of country and even city, that was, a, that was an exciting event to see those people come together saying, how can we do more for the mission of Jesus? And, uh, and you guys are making that happen, all right? So, good job. Um, maybe one of the best examples for us right here, right home, how we're better together as one is uh, the coming together, what's gonna be the launch of our brand new Downers Grove location. And um, you know what? Um, we realize that they're gonna launch, we're gonna launch January 28th, and we may not be together exactly like this before then, so uh, we just asked as many as possibly could who are part of the launch team uh, for Downers Grove and also a part of the staff team. We'd love to have you come up here so we can celebrate that. We wanna pray over you, commission you, let you know we are 500% behind you. So if you guys wanna come on up here on the thrust. And then I'd also love to have uh, John Ferguson. John, come on up here to lead us in this time. And I ask our leadership, some of our leadership commission and our lead team, if anybody from our lead team could come up here, we'd love to have you also pray for them. So we'll have, uh, maybe the, the launch team can come up here. There you go, go ahead and step up a little bit, there you go. And we'll have our leadership commission, our elders, and also our lead team behind. And uh, John, I'll let you just kinda take it from here. I personally couldn't be more proud of uh, Ted and Melissa and the team that they brought together to launch our Downers Grove location. And uh, I know January 28th for some of us seems like a long ways away, but I can guarantee you Ted and his team <laughs> does not feel like that's very far away at all now. 
And uh, when you're in the midst of preparation and planning and, and checking all the boxes on the list, uh, you know, the last thing we want to do is forget to make sure that this is completely uh, saturated in prayer. I know that reflects the heart of Ted and Melissa and the team that they put together here. So I want to ask if you would uh, go ahead and kind of reach out your hand, if you would, as a way of saying, okay, God, whatever, whatever power we have together collectively as a community, we want you to flow through us and be at work in a most powerful way through what happens uh, in Downers Grove in the coming months. And uh, don't let this be the only time you pray. Continue to pray uh, weekly, if not daily, for what God is going to do in Downers Grove in the coming months. They have a launch team of about 200 people already. But we want to see that continue to grow so that God can do what only he can do in Downers Grove. Would you pray with me? Father God, we, uh, we are so grateful for, uh, for you. God, your, your love, your kindness, your graciousness, uh, your power. God, the opportunities that you've already given us in, in, in so many places, as Dave just mentioned, to see more and more people find their way back to you. God, help us to never, ever lose that passion, that uh, deep down conviction and, and knowledge and an awareness that we are simply hopeless. Our world is simply hopeless without Jesus. And so God, we just ask uh, without any reservation as your children coming to you as our father that you would do what only you could do. God, we're, we're grateful for this amazing team, for this mission. We're grateful for the way you've already proved yourself faithful in some of the most miraculous and crazy ways as we've set the table and moved forward to launch this new location in Downers Grove. So God, we just ask that you to continue to do beyond what we could ask or imagine so that at the end of the day, God, we would look back and we would see literally hundreds and thousands of people whose lives are not the way they are today, uh, that know you in a personal and powerful way. Lord, that that community would be restored to the dream that you had for it when the idea of Downers Grove, a western suburb of Chicago, was, was first thought of. That, God, families would be reunited. Lord, that uh, people that have differences in that community would come together. God, that it, this community of people in that city of Downers Grove would be a light, Lord, like... Uh, like we can't even imagine possible now. And so God, we just ask that you would open doors. We ask that you would remove barriers. God, help us to see the opportunities before you put before us. Prepare leaders, prepare people, prepare homes, prepare small groups. Lord, in, in, in ways that when, again, we can just kind of look back and know that you were so involved and you will get all the glory, God. Lord, our prayers that you would catalyze a multiplying movement of churches all across Chicagoland who are relentlessly committed to helping people find their way back to you. We praise you and ask this in your name. Amen. Could we just uh, express our appreciation to Ted and Melissa and his team? Ted and Melissa and the whole team are, I mean, are doing a great job. As John mentioned, uh, I think we have, we're getting close to 200 people. When you count adults and kids that are part of this launch team, we have 25 small group leaders who are ready to lead small groups. Uh, continue to keep them in their prayers we're, as we're trying to secure the just right location where we're going to be able to meet. So we're uh, anxious about that, but want that to, come, to, to finish up. So, th I mean, those are just some of the wins that we have had a chance to celebrate through the One Initiative. We're still looking forward to uh, opening up a brand new kids space in Yorkville, so that's something that's still coming up. Uh, we're also looking forward to um, then also uh, space, permanent space at Lincoln and Lincoln Park uh, on Old Town. Um, some things that are a little behind, candidly, but uh, we are going to continue to pursue those things, continue to go after those things, because we feel like that is really uh, what God has for us next and what we need to be after. All right? Good stuff. Let's transition a little bit. Um, one of the things I've tried to stress at every all staff, with our staff meeting, at every leadership community over the last probably almost a uh, year and a half now is that we have to keep our eyes focused on two key objectives. I think there's two key objectives for us. We have, to, we have to keep our eyes focused on for us to accomplish the things that God has for us right now. One of them is this one initiative. Okay, we're 17 months through. We've got to finish strong in the next seven months. But the second thing that I've been talking about, and see if any of you remember this. What's the second thing we're supposed to be talking about? That was pretty weak, but nicely done. All right? <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, three C's. We, we've been kind of hitting this over and over again, and, and, and I think that, that mediocre response is why we need to talk about this one more time. <laughs> All right? Here's what I want you to do. Um, Grab the, when you came in, you got a 3C development plan. That should have been another clue, people. Um, <laughs> take this, would you? 
And here's what I want you to do, and I think you can do two or three things at once. So I'm gonna keep talking, but what I need for you to do is I want you to think about this. If you're a, a kid city leader, think about the kids that you're overseeing and, and write just, I think we've got eight blanks, there, eight of their names. If you're a student community leader, think of eight of the students that you work with and write their names. If you're a small group leader, think of eight of the people in your small group, write their names here. If you're a first impressions person, if you're a prayer ministry, if you're in the arts, go ahead and write down eight names here. Does that make sense that you work with? Are you with me? Give me a little nod. Are you tracking with me? Go ahead and do that right now. If you're a staff person or if you're a coach, then maybe what you'd put in here is leaders or coaches, put their names. Whoever it is that you oversee that you work with, put their names in here. Go ahead and do that right now, okay? There should be probably a pen in the, in the, in the, uh, in the chair in, in front of you. Then after that, what I want you to, I want you to work your way across. And I want you to think, ask yourself, how are, they do grow, how are they doing growing in these three key relationships? Celebrate your relationship with God. Connect the relationship with, with, with each other in the church. Contribute the relationship with the world. How are they doing in each of those key areas? And if you want to do something like simple, like yes, they're doing it, no, they're not doing it, a question mark, that's fine. But I would encourage you also, maybe make some comments on that. Reflect on how they're growing and continue to grow in those three relationships. Go ahead and fill that out right now, all right? Go ahead and fill that out right now. Now, while you're doing that, okay, because I know you can do two or three things at once, I'm going to ask you to do something else. I want you to think about this. You can, uh, when you get done with that too, you can uh, go ahead and uh, pull out your, uh, your cell phone, okay? You can pull out your cell phone. It's going to be kind of a little bit of a, an object lesson here, all right? And I want you to think about this. Let's go to the next slide. Asking the right question can change everything, all right? First part of the leadership community, I want to celebrate some wins, and I just want to leave you with one big idea, okay, here in the next about 10 minutes. Asking the right question can change everything, all right? Asking the just right question can change everything. It was about a half century ago that someone asked the profound question that fundamentally changed how we communicate with each other more than every day, almost every hour, if not all, even more often. He asked this question, in an era where the phone was still tethered to a wall by a squiggly cord. Anybody remember that? Okay, a few of us remember that. He actually asked this question, okay, in an era where in rural communities, you would still listen, you would, they still used a party line where everyone would listen for the pattern of rings when the phone sounded to determine if the call was for them or the next farm down the road. The guy's name was Marty Cooper. Marty Cooper was born in Chicago. He was raised in Chicago went to school on the south side at IIT, graduated with a degree in engineering, and took a job here in Chicago at Motorola. And it was Marty who asked the just right question that changed everything. And the question that this engineer working for Motorola asked, he asked this, why is it that when we want to call and talk to a person, we have to call a place? Why is it that when we want to call and talk to a person, we have to call a place. And that contrary, insightful, just right question led to a brand new era of communication where no longer did you have to call a place, but you could actually call what? A person. It led to this right here, the cell phone. Now the first cell phone, of course, didn't look like this. It was actually the Dynatech 8000X. Anybody remember those? They had the, it was like a giant brick, right? <laughs> That's what it was. That was, the, that was the first edition of it. But the just right question can change everything. I remember a beautiful fall evening on the shores of Lake Michigan by the planetarium. Sue and I are looking at the Chicago skyline. I had my arms around her. I was getting ready to ask the just right question. My heart was literally beating so hard. Sue later told me my heart was beating so hard that she could literally feel my heart thumping against her shoulder blade. <laughs> Okay? And then I asked the just right question. Guys, how many guys here have asked the just right question? Anybody going to debate that? That changes everything. Am I right? One way or another, it changes everything. Okay? Right? <laughs> it changed. Let's go back to Marty Cooper. Okay, Marty Cooper. Think about Marty Cooper, the guy, right, who, who asked the just right question that changed everything. An organization called the Tanner Group interviewed Marty Cooper and more than 250 other great innovators like him, and they found that the genesis of almost every brilliant innovation came down to asking the just right question. The just right question is this disruptive agent that cut through, can cut through years of complexity or, or even complacency, and it can redirect a leader 
It can redirect a group. It can redirect a church towards extraordinary new insights or brand new horizons or extraordinary results. That's what the just right question can do. Jesus, it's fascinating. Go back and read the gospel sometime and look for all the questions. He knew the power of a just right question. Jesus asked more questions by far than he answers. If you go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus asked 307 questions. 307 questions. He gets asked, if my math is right, 183 questions, of which he answers only three of them. <laughs> which probably is good advice for all of us small group leaders, right? <laughs> Something that Alpha's taught us, be good at asking questions, right? He knew the power of asking the just right question. In fact, if we go to Luke chapter six, and Luke chapter six is almost like a leadership community. He's gathered around him some of his closest followers, and there's also a handful of people that are kind of there just to listen in, kind of what's the noise all about, but he tells them a story. Jesus tells this story, he says, hey, there's two guys, two guys who built a home. Each of them built homes. I'll, uh, I'll embellish a little bit. In Florida. Two guys built a home in Florida. The first guy built his home on a deep, solid foundation. The second guy hurriedly built a home on just a, on a slab. Just on a slab. The hurricane came. The first house, as Jesus tells the story, was able to withstand the 175, 185 mile per hour winds, and this first house stood firm. But the second house just totally collapsed under the force, the fierce force of this hurricane. And then Jesus makes his point after telling the story. He says, many of you are like that second house. You look good on the outside, but you have no firm foundation. He goes on to make the point, I want you to be able to withstand whatever the world throws at you. I want you to build your life on a firm foundation, doing everything I taught you, to do what I taught you. And then Jesus delivers the just right question. And here's the question that he asks. Why is it that you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? Why is it that you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? And what Jesus is saying then, and I think he's saying now, is I want your, okay, leaders and community Christians, I want your life to match your words. I want your actions to match the commitments that you've made. I want you to not, not, just, not just talk the talk, but I want you to walk the walk. And I think Jesus asked that question then, I think he's asked the question now. And I think as leaders, we too need to ask our own form of that question. And I think it's a just right question. And what, here's the challenge I have for you, okay? Every kid city leader, every student leader, every adult small group leader, every first impression leader, every arts leader, every prayer team leader. Did I leave anybody out? Anybody? What is it? Security, every security leader. 412, there you go, yes, thank you. I don't wanna leave anybody out. I wanna challenge you to ask what I believe is the just right question. Because I think if we consistently ask it, it has the power to change everything, both personal transformation for people, but also to allow us as a church to accomplish the mission that God has before us. And here's the question, are you ready for the question? No, oh, well, thank you very much. I'll tell you what, before I give you the question, I'm gonna I think there's questions that we sometimes ask that are good questions, but not the just right question. So I'm gonna ask you not to ask these questions as much as you ask the just right question. I think sometimes we ask this question as leaders. Did I do a good job leading or teaching? I know for me, that I, I almost reflectively do. When I leave my small group on Wednesday, I'm driving home, and usually it's, I'm with my wife, Sue, because we go to small group together, and I'll go, how do you think it went? And when I'm saying, how do you think it went, I'm really asking, did I get, do a good job leading or facilitating or teaching, right? And that's a good question because we want to do a good job leading, facilitating, or teaching, but that's not the just right question. In fact, I would even say as kid city leaders, I know you probably leave and you go, and sometimes you feel like you win, sometimes you feel like you lost, you go, oh, I don't know. And probably a lot of it revolves around, did I do a good job teaching? I don't know, did I do a good job teaching today? It's a good question, not the just right question. And probably first impression, folks, right? You might say, okay, today, I, I, did I have the right people in the right place at the right time? Did I, did I do a good job leading? Okay, that, that, that's a good question. But that's not the just right question. I think another question we sometimes ask is the second one here. Did a lot of people attend or participate? Because that's kind of a way we keep score. If a lot of people show up in my small group, then oh, I must be, I'm doing okay. If a lot of kids, a lot of students came to my event that I, that I put on, then I must be doing okay. And you know what? We keep score of that kind of stuff. And that's an important question, a good question, but it's not the just right question. 
I think another just right question, and we hammer this next one a lot around here. Did I, uh, did I reproduce another leader, right? We talk about that a lot, a lot more than other churches because we understand the value of multiplication and movement making. That's how we get the mission accomplished. And it's really important. And we want every leader to have an apprentice leader. But you know what? Even this is not the just right question that'll change everything. I think the just right question that we need to ask as leaders at the end of every group, after every time our team comes together, every time we teach a class, I think we need to ask, here's the question. I, I want you to start asking this. Here we go. Did I develop three C Christ followers? Did I develop three C Christ followers? That is the right question that'll change everything. I, I would love for you at the end of every group, okay, at the end of your group, to, to kind of walk away and say, hey, at the end of that group, did I, do, did I do something there? Did something happen there that was gonna help people become more like Jesus, and in our terms, become three C Christ followers? At the end of every meeting, when you have a one-on-one -on -one with your apprentice, or when you're as a staff person with a coach or a coach with a leader, when you're having your one-on-ones, hey, how are we doing? Take a look at those people on that list and say, hey, how are we doing developing three C Christ followers? And remember, three C's are not programmatic. That's not programs. Those are relationships. How are they doing in the relationship with God, the relationship with others? That's how we get through this thing. And the relationship with the world, that's how we make a difference in the world. How are we doing with that? And here's the thing. I am, I am reconvinced that we, as some of us around here, maybe I'm just projecting, maybe it's just me, but we've become so familiar with some of this that we take it for granted. That we forget to remind people, no, this is how you have to reorient and reprioritize your life around those three relationships. I have a buddy that I got a chance to, to see come to faith, find his way back to God last spring and baptize him. Awesome experience. And, and, and candidly, kind of, kind of struggling through the summer. And we sat down at lunch and I, and I said, well, well, Michael, what if you did this? And I said, you know, there's three this is brand new to him, right? There's three relationships you need to orient your life around. First of all is your relationship with God. It's called celebrate. I'm writing this on a napkin for him, right? And so one of the things you do is you like would come to church every Sunday and then you also make it a priority during the week to connect with God at some point. And like he's taking notes on this stuff. He's like, so every Sunday? I'm like, yeah, every Sunday, <laughs> right? This is like a revelation. Are you with me? Celebrate. And then I said, and connect. We're getting ready to restart our small groups. It's gonna be on Tuesday night. You know what? You do everything you can. Even your travel, you try to reprioritize your life so you are there and you're doing life with those folks. Those are the people that are gonna get you through anything. And you're gonna get them through anything. Oh, he said, yeah, that makes sense. That's been kind of my experience. It's helped a lot when I've done that. And then the third thing is contribute. This was brand new to him. You have some unique things to share with the whole world, some unique gifts. And he started talking about some of his own unique experiences, the, the, how he'd like to help students and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Michael. And it, it was, I'm, I'm not kidding. And I, I mean, we've talked about three C's for so long that sometimes you forget that we have to remind everybody else, no, you have to reorient your entire life around these three, three relationships or it doesn't work the way Jesus intended to do because you're not doing the things Jesus said he wanted you to do. You're just saying, Lord, Lord. Are you with me on that? That's what we're talking about here. It was funny, so I was texting him this week because his son had a really good, uh, really good meet, cross-country meet, and I was texting him, congratulations, we're back and forth. And then in the middle of it, he just kind of interrupts and he, and, he, and he texts me back, celebrate, connect, contribute. And here's what he said next in the text. He says, thank you. It demystifies the gift. It demystifies the gift. L let me push on you a little bit. Some of you are leaders. You've been around this church thing for a long time. So you're kind of looking for more mystery. You're kind of looking for something. You know what I mean? Some people are still trying to figure out how does this thing even work? Does that make sense? And so here's, the th here's, what, here's what I want you to do. Kid City, students, adults, everybody, no matter who you work with, teach them this is how we earn our lives as followers of Jesus. We don't just say, Lord, Lord, we do what Jesus told us to do. If you remember, we talked about this back in May. We said, May, hey, we talk about helping people find their way back to God. If you start here and we help people find their way back to God, you know what that is? That's the process, okay? You start over here, you're far from God, maybe you show up at church, you eventually make, starts making sense to you, you get baptized, you get in a small group, you begin to understand you have gifts, you start serving, and maybe you start giving money, all those things. That's the process of finding your way back to God. You know what the product is? In our terminology, so we can understand it, 
the product, what we're trying to do, disciple making in our context, disciple making is 3C Christ followers. 3C Christ followers. And here's what I'd love for you to do. Use this handout. I think we got another slide here. Go to the next slide. Use it and make it. This one's kind of funny. Bill Hybels. How did he get on my list? I don't know what happened there. Um, but use this. Our, our, our PowerPoint people have a sense of humor. Um, use this list, okay? Use this tool, rather. I'm sorry. And, 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 and when you have, at the end of your group, say, okay, how did we do helping everybody grow as 3C Christ followers? When you're having your one-on-one -on -one with your apprentice, or if a coach with a leader or staff with a coach, go through this list. How are we doing developing more and better 3C Christ followers? At the end of a, end of a, end of a kind of a, a session, we kind of operate in trimesters. In a trimester, say again, how did we do developing more and better 3C Christ followers? I am telling you, hear me on this, people. Hear me on this, okay? If, I'm gonna keep talking if you don't tell, acknowledge you're hearing me on this, okay? <laughs> Here's the deal. This is the question. This is the key leverage point. This is the question that can change everything. Because if we get everybody understanding this is how we have to reorient our lives, everybody will mature in Christ. They won't be saying, Lord, Lord. They'll be doing the stuff that Jesus said. Every person will be doing that. They'll be building their life on a firm foundation. They'll be able to withstand the storms of life. And if every person can withstand that and they're doing the things Jesus wants them to do, together, when we come together, when everybody's doing that, then we become a mighty force and we can accomplish anything that God has for us. All right? That's the key question. That's the just right question. All right, you clap, so I better stop talking. All right.